morning to you. Good afternoon or good evening whenever you are watching this uh, video of our worship service at Salem Covenant Church on June 14th, 2020. And thank you for watching. We really, really appreciate it. 
I'm just back. I'm actually recording this on Friday, but uh, just back from my first pandemic wedding. And so we want to say congratulations to uh, Steve and Katie Mulcahy, who were uh, just married on the Lake uh, Quinsigamond at uh, the Mulcahy property of Sunset uh, Beach, which was a, a beautiful, beautiful site. And so we want to congratulate them and also congratulate Wendy and, and Phil Mulcahy uh, as their son was uh, married. But one of the things that I learned in uh, being at this uh, kind of first service that I've done in quite a long time is just how hard it is not to immediately want to go up and shake one's hand or, or hug a person uh, that you haven't seen for a long time and you like so uh, very much. It's very, very difficult. Um, so one of the things that is, is hard for us as a church family is, is how we're going to stay together as a church family. And so we have a, a new spot on our uh, videos here for worship, and that is that it's called uh, Salem's People. And that is that we're going to invite uh, families, individuals, um, couples, whichever is the makeup, to uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how they've been spending this pandemic time. And today we have the Moise family, who is going to share uh, just a little bit, uh, Anne Jacquois, is a uh, PhD student um, at the U uh, UMass uh, Med School. She's just a hair away from her PhD in uh, biochemistry. Jocelyn um, is how they say it in, in Haiti, but we know him as, as Joe. Joe is in uh, IT and they have two uh, wonderful, wonderful boys who are gonna be four years old, twins, uh, four years old on Sunday, June 14th. So happy birthday to them. And let's, let's watch the tape that they um, shot for us. Good morning, church. Good morning, Pastor Nielsen. Thank you for the opportunity to um, be part of this. Um, we're checking in and updating you guys about what we've been doing for the past three months. Um, so I was home mostly the entire time because my lab closed um, early March and just recently got back to work. Um, but most of the, I've been really be home with the boys and spending time with them and trying to be a full-time mom and teacher. And I'm looking forward to going back to church and hopefully everybody have been doing well and keeping safe and looking forward to seeing you guys when church is back yeah well good um as for me uh it's the same you know being home with the kids um i did get um furloughed from my job but and again has got always good to us um not even a week after i got a new position it's a better position and i'm happy about that and god has been blessing our family and i hope god does the same for you guys at the church and the pastor and i'm looking forward to go back to church as well um I have not been able to see the services online, but uh, I know you guys are doing a good job. And guys, you want to say something to Pastor? You want to say something? Say hi. 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 Say hi. Hi. Well, again, um, thank you for letting us um, check in. And you have anything else you want to say? Well, thank you and uh, keep safe. Bye. Bye. Say bye, guys. Bye.
Welcome. Welcome to Salem Covenant Church. My name is Josh, and I'll be reading the scripture for t this week. The scripture for this week comes from the chapter of e the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 2 to 8a, and it reads as follows. They had journeyed from Rephidim, entered the wilderness of Sinai, and camped in the wilderness. Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses, so Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, Everything that the Lord has spoken we will do. Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So hi to all the kids. It's great to see you. And um, we have been talking about uh, the, all the good gifts that God gives to us. There's an expression that goes something like, God is good, and uh, you follow it with, God is good all the time. And that is, that is right. So we've talked about lots of different animals, which are uh, great things. We've looked at peepers, we've looked at bears, we've looked at bats, we've looked at uh, beavers, we've looked a lot of bee ones. But um, I remember that um, my father-in-law, who was a minister, once did a children's time in which he brought out a little puppy. And what he said about that little puppy was that the love that little puppies give is the closest thing to the unconditional love of God. And so at the Nilsson home, we had a new uh, family member join us. And I'm going to allow the, uh, the video to um, tell the story. Here it is.
they left Rephidim and came to the wilderness. So that's, that was what was read for us earlier, the wilderness of, of Sinai. Sinai was the, the mountain of God, and geographically, it, it sits at the very center of Israel's, all of Israel's wandering. Israel is on the brink of something, but it will take time, effort, and it's a journey demanding perseverance and above all, robust kind of stick to itness. Here's a headline from our week. We must finally let equality, not privilege, lead. One gets the sense that today we are not far from our own Sinai these days. This is our chance, America, to really get things right. We must finally let equality, not privilege, lead. We cannot let it go as people of faith. We cannot let it be just another cathartic experience and go back to go back to old ways of ordering life. Something big is happening. God is doing something among us. And it is hard. It's shaming to look squarely at it. Racism and racial inequality is something that has been baked right into us. Reality has been ignored for far, far too long. But this is our chance to catch a corner of the kingdom. And it is hard. It is also thrilling. When was the last time that your faith was thrilling? They tell me that there was exactly three moments of massive disruption, massive destabilization in the Old Testament world. The Tower of Babel was one, the Egyptian slavery and Exodus, the other one, and the final was the great exile. And afterward, God's reconstitution of the people, after they experience the trauma and the devastation, the very fabric of their lives destabilized, and in three of those times, God's reconstitution of the people was for mission. In our text specifically, the reconstitution was not just to be a treasured possession, but it was to become a priestly kingdom. It was to become a holy nation. This is our opportunity. Our texts are often paired with, with texts from Matthew, like, like last week, which was the, the Great Commission the sending of us out into the world. And then it was also about the sending of the apostles, which was the text, which if we read the gospel text for today, it was the, the sending out of the apostles. Now, Mark and Luke, it seems to, when they send people out, it seems to do it in a way in which they are a bit like observers in their sendings. Matthew tells it differently. Matthew seems to tell it like it is. Matthew has Jesus telling those disciples that the same realities that Jesus went up against, the same hostilities that, that, Jesus, that Jesus met, that they would most surely meet those same hostilities. It was oppressive times. The Jesus followers of the day were being called out in intolerable times. But in moving out into the hard world with a new message of grace and love, there was always tucked somewhere in the folds of that, of that mission hints of blessing and presence 
that would be there to sustain them if they were willing to take it to the street. Our Exodus story, if you look at it, it is a communication event. God puts out a word through Moses. This is what I want you to say. And if they can hear it, if they really, really listen to that word, they will obey. It's the same with the disciples. They are called, and if they really hear it, they will obey. Those two words, the two words of call and the word obey are intertwined together. They are held together. They are, they are twin born. The word in Greek is kaleo, hear. But hearing is always, always linked with obeying. And so we hear it 1,158 times in, in scripture. One does not hear the word of God and find themselves flat-footed. You hear the word, and then you are sent out out of the street. In times of destabilization, moments of massive disruption, afterward, God's reconstitution of the people has always been about mission. This is our chance. This is our call. We must allow equality, not privilege, to lead. And so many of you probably recognize that, that iconic picture that I put up earlier in, in the video. 1968, that year of incredible, incredible turmoil. Olympic Games, Mexico City, the men's 200 meters, powerful image of two barefoot black men, their heads bowed, their black love fists in the air, while the U.S. national anthem played strong gesture of American civil rights in years of tragedies in the deaths of King and, and Bobby Kennedy. It's a strong image, evoking a lot of emotion from people from all sorts of different, different sides. That race was really supposed to be about two men, the Americans. The two men, Tommy the Jet Smith and John Carlos, two American sprinters whose times were 20.14 seconds and 20.12 seconds respectfully coming into the race. But there is a third on the stand as there always is. And this one was an unknown, Peter Norman, who ran an incredible 20.22 seconds in the semis to qualify for the finals. He is Australian. Now the day of the race, Norman goes out and he runs the race of his life coming in at 20.06, his best time ever. It is an Australian record that stands 47 years later. But Tommy the Jet responded to Norman's Australian record with a world record of his own. And so it was American Tommy Smith who got the gold. It was Australian Peter Norman who got the silver. And it was American John Carlos who got who got the bronze. But what happened on stage afterwards is really the story. Now, Smith and Carlos, the Americans had decided that they wanted to show the entire world their support and fight for human rights. And the word kind of, kind of spread throughout the whole Olympic village. And they got a lot of support by many, many athletes all over, all over the world. Norman is a white man from Australia. 
Australia at the time is a country that had strict apartheid laws, heavy restrictions on non-white immigration and discriminatory laws against Aboriginal people. Now the two American asked Norman, they asked him before they got up on stage if, if he believed in human rights. Norman said he did. Did he believe in God? They asked him. And as a practicing member of the Salvation Army, he said that he strongly believed in God. Carlos said that he expected to see in, in Norman's eyes fear. But what he experienced and what he saw in Norman's eyes was really, was really great, great love. Norman said that he wanted to stand with them in the protest that they were going to, going to offer on, on the stage. They got up on the stage. All of them were, were wearing an Olympic project for human rights badge. And so you see that, you see that just above their, just above their hearts in, in the picture. It's a movement for, for equality. Carlos and Smith received their medals in bare feet, representing the poverty facing people of color. They wore the gloves, famous symbol of the Black Panthers cause. Now, after receiving their medals, the American delegation vowed that these athletes would pay the price for the rest of their lives. The American Smith and Carlos were immediately suspended from the Olympic team and expelled from the Olympic Village. At home, they faced heavy repercussions and death threats. But time, in the end, proved them right. And their image was, their image was restored, and actually a statue. A statue was placed of that famous protest for equality. It was erected at San Jose State University. Peter Norman did not fare as well. When Norman got back to his home country of Australia, he was treated like an outsider. His family was outcasted. He could not find work anywhere. Norman qualified 13 times for the men's 200 in the Olympics, five times for the 100 for the Olympics. He was barred from any participation in competitive running. Because of an injury, he contracted gangrene, which led him then to spiral down in depression and also in alcoholism. It was John Carlos who said that if we were getting beat up at home, Peter was facing an entire country and he had to face it alone. Norman was, was actually given one chance, one chance to save himself. He was invited to condemn his co-athletes, Carlos and Smith's gesture in exchange for a full pardon by the system that had ostracized him. He could have gotten a cushy job with the Olympic Committee. He could have been part of the, the Sydney Olympic Games, but he never gave in. He never condemned the choice of his two American friends. Norman died suddenly of a heart attack in 2006 without his country ever having apologized for their treatment of him. At his funeral, Norman's friends, since, since that very moment in 68, Smith and Carlos were his pallbearers, sending him off as a hero.
pictures are deceiving. In a time of massive destabilization, moments of massive, massive unrest, they heard the call, they listened, and they obeyed. Equality. not privilege, must finally lead. Now's the time. Now's the time. The world's chanced to get it right. Now's the time.